I'm going to start very quickly by introducing each person and getting them to say a little bit uh, as an overview about what they do. So first of all, Hugh Purcell on my far right, who represents ESODOC. Hugh, can you tell us a little bit about ESODOC? Okay, well, until earlier this year, I was the head of studies at ESODOC. I, I set it up 11 years ago. I left because I was enjoying it too much, <laughs> meaning I thought they deserved somebody younger and in touch. And now my successor is Sabine Bubeck Putz, who is a commissioning editor at Arte. The reason she's not here is our third session is taking place now at Palermo in Sicily. It's a training workshop to encourage documentary makers to uh, work in the areas of social concern, hence uh, European social documentary and human rights. Hence, we've always had outreach to NGO filmmakers and we've always also encouraged uh, new media. Um, you come along, you apply, you come along with a project and uh, over three workshops, uh, amongst many other things we do, practical courses, visiting speakers, you, you bone up your project and you pitch it to five commissioning editors at the end. Three last year, I will tell you, with no more than a sentence, because they give an idea of what we do. The first is called Drones, which is a very effective film, TV and festival, Norwegian, uh, typical because it's, it's a polemical anti-drones movie. The second, uh, Queen of Hearts, probably the best documentary I've ever seen in a way. It's a Polish documentary about a deaf and dumb Roma girl who expresses her dislike of uh, being evicted from a squatting camp by song and dance routines, rather like Slumdog Millionaire. Brilliant film. And the third, quite different, an internet called Ara Amber about a utopian village in Ethiopia where the head man is against sexism, he's against, um, he's against sexism, religion, and aid. And this is intended for discussion in schools where you can, you, can, you can interact with this online project and discuss these themes. And um, that's very successful. Again, that comes from the, uh, Finland, actually. And it's an example of our heavy online presence. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, next on my right is Nicole Van Schaik, who is at Brit Doc Foundation um, and is involved in various initiatives. Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so Brit Doc is a film fund, um, and we also run a range of programs where we enable filmmakers to connect with wider audiences and to create a real change. Um, and Creative Europe supports two of our programs. Um, one of them, which you might have heard about, is the European edition of Good Pitch, which is where we connect filmmakers to you know, lots of organizations from across civil society, including foundations, NGOs, philanthropists, uh, brands, technology innovators, etc. cetera. Um, and part of the Good Pitch program um, is our Impact Producers Lab, where we train impact producers, who are the people that are taking the film, um, you know, to their campaigning strategy, raise the funding for it, and actually implement the campaign and create change. Okay, thank you very much. And last but not least, Uli Hess, who is representing the Documentary Campus. Uli. Yeah, Documentary Campus, and particularly the Master School. I did it uh, myself in 2008. Um, and it's basically about a year or four week workshops over the period of a year. And the focus is on international co productions, particularly funding, development for an international audience, and how to get it made. So, meaning, who can you approach for money? How do you prepare a project? How do you prepare a pitch? And how do you pitch the project? Okay. So um, we're going to start with the first question, which is just, oh, I should probably mention, I'm from, um, I represent the chair, I'm the chair of the European Documentary Network. Does anyone know the EDN at all? Okay, fantastic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great organization, uh, an umbrella organization across Europe representing uh, nearly a thousand filmmakers who are paid members. And it runs various training initiatives, but basically links all the uh, different activities together. One thing that is very helpful is that the EDM publish a financing guide, which has a who's who of kind of all the commissioning editors and film funds uh, across Europe. And has also just launched, a, I feel like I'm plugging the EDM here, has also just launched a big co-production guide, which is a European guide to international co-production. Which brings me on to the next point. Inherent in uh, these training initiatives is helping you finance a documentary. And that's what a lot of people really care about when it comes down to it. And finance within this model is normally what's called international co-production, which I'm sure, as many of you know, means bringing little bits of money from lots of different places. 
And that seems to be the main way in which we're funding what's called creative documentary, which is the word that's often used in docs in Europe. So my first question really to Uli, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if you can just tell us a little bit, a little bit about how that works within the documentary campus in terms of having a project and where you start looking in terms of a finance plan. So actually, you look at the finance plan very, very soon. The first two workshops are about development and really focusing your project to certain territories, to certain audiences. And particularly the third workshop, the pre-pitch workshop, is how to pitch your project and who are your targets, really. So um, at the pitch and Leipzig Dog Fest, you sit in front or you stand in front of 40, 30 or 40 commission, commissioning editors and you perform your pitch. And um, that means you try to sell it. Um, afterwards, you get a feedback. But as a first time pitcher, you never know what is really being meant by, hey, we, we, we like your project. So the, the fourth workshop is really making sense of what was being said, um, the feedback you got, and what does it mean in terms of financing. That means, for example, you think, okay, I got an, a commitment maybe already or an interest from this territory, from this country, from this country, and from this country, but it won't make, it, it, it's not enough money to actually make the documentary. So where do I get the rest of the money? Are there distributors who can step in? Are there other alternative um, models which I can draw on? And um, it's really about making a finance strategy for the next year. And I think the, the most helpful thing is to understand is, first of all, you're not alone in your frustration with this process. And uh, you get a lot of contacts and a lot of feedback and, and help from the people you, you are pitching with. Both um, ESODOC and Mars School offer the opportunity within one of the final sessions, or I think the penultimate session, to pitch to a range of commissioning editors. And there's various success stories, which if we've got time, um, we'll talk about. But Hugh, I just want to quickly turn to you and ask that, um, you know, documentary is kind of the new black, as some people look at it. There's a huge range of opportunities, both for finance and distribution. What, in what ways are you able to help filmmakers access non-conventional funds rather than just the broadcasters as the model changes? Yes. Um, well, now, I, I, well, I'll give you a case study very briefly because I suppose it's at us at our best. We had a project two years ago about a retired flamenco dancer in Spain who'd emerged from obscurity to tell her life story. Brilliant film. No money in Spain at all really. The girl came along to Isodoc and she pitched it at the end. Now this is the conventional bit. It was picked up by uh, um, Heino Decker, right? Heino Decker? Yeah, the, the German um, distributor for a while. They didn't get on all that well. So how was she going to get some money? We encouraged her to make co-productions. This is sort of conventional, which began on Isodoc. In the end, uh, she had a French co-producer who could access money from a French source, CMC, an American co-producer who could access money from PBS Latin America, and she got an archive deal with the uh, Spanish television that no money, and she got a grant from a flamenco outfit in America. The snag of this, which happens all too often, is that she had a lot of interest depending on the quality of her rough cut but how could she get the money to make the rough cut? This was the point. So she scratched together over a year or 18 months, working free with all her team, maybe 50 or $60,000. And um, an instrumental of that was a Euro grant, a EU media grant, which is conventional, so I won't go any more to that. Uh, and she's now um, uh, reaping the harvest of that because although she's been turned down by PBS Latin America, there's an interest in PBS America, and I think she will get the film made for about $150,000, uh, and that will be three or four years of her life, and it's a really big learning experience. Is it worth doing? Would she do it again? Well, she probably would, but it's a hell of a struggle. <clears throat> do you still want to all be documentary filmmakers? <laughs> uh, Nicole, uh, two questions for you. Um, uh, Obviously, you're involved with the Future Producer project and uh, the Good Pitch, and that's obviously helping uh, 
not only the good pitch helping people get films together, which have a campaigning or social nature, but then it's about the outreach. So really two questions. The first one is, everyone's going on about a creative documentary, and this is the, uh, this is the category when you're applying for funds through Creative Europe, creative documentary. So it'd be helpful to get a sense of what you think that means. And the second thing is just to talk a little bit about how those documentaries which have a, a campaigning focus can be helped by the initiatives that you're running. You got a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> all squashed out. Um, creative documentary. Well, it all starts with a good film. Like, that's what we truly believe. So, uh, you know, <laughs> good pitch selects films. So it needs to have a social issue at its heart. Um, but it still needs to be a good film. So it shouldn't just be a film about, you know, bullying in schools, for example, but it needs to be creatively ambitious and beautiful. And it needs to touch you when you watch it. You know, that's what film does. So I can't really explain that. Like, you know, that a good film is a good film and we all will know it when it's a good film. You know, you'll feel it. No, that's fine. I guess it's also the distinction as opposed to television documentary and that oh, of when they're course, so yeah. creative, it's about So maybe a good example is um, the, po the possibilities are endless. Have anybody, has anybody seen that? Or Virunga? Has nobody yeah. seen Virunga? Yeah, okay. Virunga is a great example. So this is um, like a hardcore investigative journalism film, undercover footage, um, you know, combined with like a beautifully shot, like, you know, environmental film, I guess. Um, you know, and th they came to us very early and they went through the Good Pitch program. We then came on board as executive producers with film funds and now it was Oscar, uh, nominated for the Oscar um, and the Emmys, etc. So really strong film with a really good story, um, but also is telling it in, a, in such a way that everybody can engage with it. Like, you know, the characters were very compelling. Um, it, it's just, you know, when you have a good story, you know it. <laughs> tell us a little bit about the good pitch. How, how, how can that help a filmmaker? And what's the best stage to kind of align mm. oneself with the good pitch? Yeah, so um, a lot of filmmakers come to us when they are at the early stages of production. Um, so this is where you will kind of know what the storyline is going to be. Um, but you're also looking for production funds or completion funds. Um, and you're looking to actually do something with your film. You want to create a change because you feel so strongly about the issues that are highlighted in your film that you're looking for campaign partners that can help you access audiences um, and actually you know, maybe change the law or you want to you know, reach 10 million children across Europe um, because you want to stop bullying in schools. Again, the bullying example. Um, so that's what Good Pitch is for. It can connect you to funders and it can connect you to all those kind of different partners. Um, and we only select seven films for each edition that we do. We do one in Europe each year and one in North America. Um, and then we train a range of hosts across the globe that are now doing their own Good Pitch Squared events as well. Um, so yeah. That's great, thank you. I'm aware we've been pushed for time, so I want to move over to, to Uli to uh, ask a quick question. Often with these initiatives, uh, well, with being a filmmaker or a producer in documentary, a large part of it is who you know as well as what you know. And to what extent does Documentary Campus help facilitate that kind of networking? It's a horrible word, but very necessary. Um, it helped me a, a great deal, really, because I knew no one in the documentary world before that. Um, and at the end, I knew nearly every um, commissioning editor in Europe and in the US, and a lot of the main uh, distributors. So I think networking is a huge um, part of it, not only that you actually know and know how to approach commissioning editors and distributors and all the people who have money and can help you make the film, but also you have a huge um, network uh, of filmmakers and people who can help you out with, can you recommend a cameraman, can you recommend an editor, um, can, you, can you give me feedback for storytelling, um, at the end, I really had the feeling I know the landscape of documentary making, mm -hmm. uh, not only in Europe, uh, but also in the US and Australia. It, I really understood what the industry uh, was about, yes, particularly creative, in, uh, creative documentaries, and also made for television documentaries, everything that is made internationally. So it helped me a lot, and it was just the begin of really um, a career in, in um, international documentary projects. 
Uh, and if we had time, which we don't, uh, I know that Uli can give you uh, anecdotes and case studies of some good films, the latest one being Jerry Rothwell's... Um, How to Change the World just started in the cinemas and huge success. And if you haven't seen, seen it? it, it's brilliant. It's the, really, that's the really Green good. Piece documentary, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's really, so, really good. And that went through exactly at the same time. And Jerry's making some absolutely fantastic films. We've got about two and a half minutes left, so let's try and quickly open up to questions. Any questions at all? Yes, gentlemen here. Yeah. Um, the case study that you mentioned, the £150,000 spent on the flamenco documentary, what kind of return on investment get on their investment? Must be some money. Well, she wasn't. The only investment she had, actually, which is what no one's talked about, is, um, is crowdfunding which I really encourage crowdfunding, and she, made, she got 15,000, 20,000 from that. The investment was little, little sort of gifts handed out uh, and names on the credits and all the rest. But she, didn't, she wasn't interested in investment. She was interested in sales. Now, the sales will bring the distributor money, of course, otherwise they wouldn't do it. Um, let's say PBS in America. It's, it's probably worth clarifying this, that unlike the fiction film model, most documentary money comes in the form of it's non-repayable. So it's either coming from public service broadcasters who don't expect a return on investment. It's coming from grants and foundations who don't expect a return on investment. So it's not that kind of... It, it's very rarely an equity investment model. So investors Sorry, really, they don't Their grant givers more than investors, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. in, in, if, in that sense. Unless it's a big theatrical feature. Um, what about... Through this is probably a longer question which we yeah. can answer individually, but the answer to but that I'm is yes or no. I suggest you talk to these guys afterwards. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you had a question as well. So um, you're involved in a project working with people with dementia and they'll be making a film and the question is, is that a documentary? Oh, can I answer that question? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm very excited by that. I mean, one of the things we've always done at Easter Talk is what's called participatory video, which is to teach uh, ordinary people, villagers or, or people who've never been near a camera, uh, prisoners, uh, people with dementia even, uh, how to use a camera. First of all, that's very enabling in itself. Secondly, it can often make quite a good little film if professionally edited or inserted into a more orthodox documentary as a little sort of few minutes bit. And if you want to know some fantastic PB films, Google Bet Salem, which is an Israeli NGO which gives cameras to Palestinians to film settlers bashing them about on their land. And I mean, those are really strong little films. And if they're not shown on television, they're shown online, which is where the audiences are these days. So I encourage you to do what you're doing. Do we have time for one more question, or do I need to wrap it up? One more? Yes. Very quick question. Yes. How does that one make sense? Well, by God, funding, it always comes back to funding. I wish Paulina was here. Being uh, Helsinki, being Finland, the Foreign Office put money into the film. There are film foundations. Uh, countries with film foundations go to. Countries with, a, with a, a, either a Foreign Office or a, a Development uh, a, a Ministry go there as well. And did the school pay for it online? No, that's pro bono. She, she got a lot of foundation money. I think she got money from Ford Foundation in the end. It took her a long time. I think we need to conclude now, but I'm sure everyone is around, including myself, for some questions. Uh, but thank you very much to the panel and for the audience for listening. Thank you.